You reference intellectual sovereignty. What is it and why is it so important? Well, intellectual sovereignty is the freedom and authority over one's thoughts and political desires from outside forces. And in terms of what that really means for Rusins, I really think it is the number one building block to any nation. Now, when people think of nation, they think more in a legal term. So, for example, um, a government uh, with borders and a military and a head of state. But there's also another meaning to that. And you can see this most clearly, for example, in Native American tribes. Now, uh, some of them do actually have their own borders and kind of a tribal authority over, over their own land. But in a broader sense, for example, when they're talking about Navajo Nation or something like that, it's a collective history, culture, and language. So when I'm talking about nation in duty and sovereignty, I'm talking about it from a more philosophical sense like that. Now, why it's important is mainly because it's also the fabric that holds uh, a nation together. So, y you know, you've heard people say, for example, like, if you don't use something, you lose it, right? And so if a nation doesn't continually make sure that they do have intellectual sovereignty, they, lo they start losing the intellectual ability to govern themselves, right? And we can even see this from our own history. How do you know? Rusins lack intellectual sovereignty? Well, you can see it in many different ways, right? So I think the biggest one, you're looking at it just from the outset, is that we, we have no real political desires, right? It's this kind of vague, we want to be recognized, and we just kind of want to go back to the village and live our lives. You know, people mistake me saying that having to have political desire, automatically going straight to, oh revolution and you know you're going way to the extreme of you know we want separatism and and independence but there has to be some good middle ground between having nothing and wanting complete control own country and something like this and so it's more in terms of even recognizing that we even have the ability to try to guide our own way which is the most important right another thing that you see too with this is that we don't have any real higher level institutions um, of our own. So for example, there is universities within Poland, Slovakia, I'm thinking, you, you know, University of Preshov, and there's some Lemko studies within Poland. Uh, but this is more treated as a novelty, so to speak, where it's not in Rusyn. Uh, well, I believe the Preshov University is in Rusyn, but it's not on stuff specifically, um, not specifically related to Rusins, right? So whether it be about the language or about Rusin history or uh, something like that. Though when you know when you are having, I don't know personally, when there is that kind of space of opening up for Rusins is when there's opportunities for people to speak Rusin and to be kind of enveloped in that Rusin culture environment when it's not specifically about Rusin things. So what I'm talking about is whether it be literature, whether it be science, whether it be math, what, what you could call more common areas, right? That don't exactly need a, uh, or are not exactly about a cultural background. And that's just something we completely lack. I mean, we have some elementary schools and stuff like that. And we used to have um, some kind of summer, not summer schools, but, but you could call them Sunday schools within Transcarpathia, but they're not open anymore. And, and with that, that is, um, you know, that is by far the second biggest kind of indicator of that too. The, the place where it's worst, and this comes as no surprise, right, is within Transcarpathia, where nobody's taught local history. Right? They're all fed the national project of Ukraine and learning their culture and, and history. It's not necessarily out of, they don't go out of their way, I think most of the time, to purposely uh, hide who Rusins are and to kind of um, manufacture a different narrative, where that, that of course has taken place throughout history. But I just think it's more that Transcarpathia is such a small part of a greater nation that it really does get overlooked sometimes. And so this is especially harmful for young minds in that it warps their mindset and that they have no actual structure 
to understand what Rufsen is in a true sense that's not uh, done and that's not created by other people. It, they only associate what being Rusin is, if not what their home life is, whatever that is, in comparison to if their parents believe they're Rusin or something like that. Their only mental framework of what being a Rusin is, is associated with, with what the system desires it to be so. So in the case of Ukraine here, we're primarily talking about two things. Primarily being ancient name for Ukrainians, that's, that, that's dead. Right, so you have that kind of mental framework of um, it's dead, it's gone, Ukrainian is what came out of it. Uh, but then also separatism with Russia, which is of course a very powerful message right now, especially with the war that's still taking place within, within Eastern Ukraine. So both of those t together, it gives a very negative view and it's very hard to step outside that framework given the education system and given the political environment that those people are in. If people were trying to change the situation, what would they have to do and what would they have to be ready for? I'd say the first point is that's a very dangerous game to play, right? Because a lot of the time, and um, people may say, oh, this you're, you're going a little bit too Machiavellian with this, right? A, a lot of the time with these situations is that if you are trying to accomplish something in this realm, in this kind of area, it's going against the direct interests of another nation, right? So, for example, if if I'm trying to make cultural inroads within Transcarpathia and I'm trying to help people understand their Rusin identity more, this is in direct opposition to the Ukrainian state. Now, I'm not talking about from the average person's perspective, but we're talking about from a national level. Um, it, it, it's of course against, and arguing as though these things can work together somehow is, I think, naive. Or people just don't want to say it because they fear of the backlash, backlash that would be caused by that. Now that's not to say, for example, that I don't think Rusins can, can work being within, within Ukraine and, I, that, and that I don't think there can be a solution with that. But I think that to have that solution, Ukraine would need to abandon the idea that Transcarpathia is Ukrainian, um, ethnically speaking. You know, we're, I'm not talking about from a administrative standpoint or you know, national security standpoint. And so that is still a loss, so to speak. You know, I don't want to use that term because it sounds as almost as like a you know some type of sports game or whatever. But it is a loss of a dream and it's a loss of a goal. And so, you know, there is, and this is, this is what I like to tell people too, is that there's no room to compromise in the realm of identity. And now there is some political aspects, right? So this is why I talk about like, you know, we don't need to go straight to separatism. We don't need to go straight to, you know, something like that. Um, but there's no compromise, I think, in, in a lot of Rusin's minds of that. There's no compromise in that. No, we're not Rusin Ukrainians. You know, we're not Ukrainians, but with like a little bit of flavor, we're, we're Rusins and we're not moving from that position at all. And that's where it gets dangerous because there's no talking, there's no talking about, well, hey, let's just get together and talk things out here, right? And so if you're going to step into this zone, you have to be ready of what comes with it. You know, if we are not in the same position as, for example, uh, a Polish person, that really wants to uh, reignite Polish culture. I'm just giving a, you know, a basic example here in that no one is going to be angry um, within Poland that some Polish person is, is trying to do that. And because they have a state that, 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 that supports that national identity. And so you, know, you just have to recognize is that it's just, it's not as, it's, it's not gonna be easy, number one, and also number two is that you have to be ready for the backlash. You have to be ready for the har the possible harm to yourself that comes with it. And so I think actually most people shouldn't try to do this. I think most people in if, if talk about broad scale here, if talk about um, you know starting cultural organizations or you know really getting thick you know into the thick of it. I think most people would, would be best served, whether it be making sure that their children know that they're Rusins and teaching their children how to speak the Russian language, 
and hanging out with other reasons. I think for most people, that is a perfectly achievable and desirable goal. So. Do you yourself think there's a chance in the future for peace between Ukrainians and Rusins and every party in Transcarpathia? I think there's certainly, in, if we're talking long term, the thing that baffles me, it shouldn't, but it does a little bit baffle me, uh, is that Ukrainians seem to come on the, the defensive about it while also attacking us, you know, like kind of like they screamed in pain as they lashed out and stabbed us, right, in a way, and that um, our goal is not to dominate them. Our goal is not to overstep the boundaries of our homeland as we view it, right? So uh, people, this is another question which I'll, of course, get to later, but it's somewhat Ill, ill-defined, but at least we can come to an agreement, at least among Rusins, that Subcarpathian Rus within, within Hungary is definitely Rusin. So if we're going from at least that definition, we can talk about Lemkos later, um, if we're going off that definition, we don't want to overstep our, our bounds, so to speak. But we also want complete um, cultural and political authority within that. Within that. Now, what, what I mean complete, I don't necessarily mean being our, being our own country, but that we don't have policies working against us and that we have the policies within our, our region working, within, working with our best interests at heart. And so there's certainly room for peace, but Ukrainians have to understand that from our perspective, however crazy you think it is, uh, we see you as the, as the aggressors. We see it as in, you are trying to destroy what we have and mold us into Ukrainians. And so we are on a defensive battle here. And I think when they realize, you know, and this is the picture that Kiev paints. And when, and when I mean Kiev, I mean the kind of philosophical representation of the central government within Kiev is that they paint us as aggressors allied with Russia and trying to hurt Ukraine. And uh, I think certainly in terms of our historical past, we were very close with, with Russia in terms of, um, in terms of uh, cultural allegiance, even sometimes political allegiance. But they have to realize it's not 1920 anymore, or like 1860 Adolf Dobryansky times here in that we we see ourselves as in as our own independent people. And so when they come to that realization uh, that we are not attacking them, we are not on, you know, we don't view it as like we're trying to dominate them there can be some understanding there if they're willing to work on that. Now, I am no, uh, I'm no uh, optimist, frankly. And do I think that that will change anytime soon? Certainly not. And I think we'll get, you know, get onto this later. Uh, but, you know, there has to be a lot of understanding from their side. And because we've already, I think, with the activists currently within, within the community have done more than enough in terms of trying to understand their position. And it's really not, you know, if you ask any legit Russian activist, they will understand where Ukraine is at. We will understand that Russia is literally, they're at war with Russia, and that they have a lot of internal problems, whether it be West and East, no matter how overblown that is. Uh, they have a lot of problems with even speaking their own language, not, not so much anymore. So we can understand how tenuous of a position that they are in, but they refuse to give us any, any leeway at all. So I just think they have to meet us somewhere in the middle. Now, in regards to, I, I think you said, within the entirety of Transcarpathia, um, the Hungarians, I think, are a whole different story that I'm not super sure I'm qualified to talk on. Uh, I, I would say, though, that Rusins and Hungarians, I mean, I know it sounds crazy because they did invade us technically during during World War Two, but on an ethnic level, we don't have problems really, and so that I think is a whole separate discussion on its own. Okay. So going back to intellectual sovereignty, 
how would you create more? Well, I start with first with actually realizing the position that we are in better. And by this, I mean is that um, we have to do more to kind of create that space, right? So in terms of make it a point to not rely on any funding from the Slovak government to, fo to fund our own institutions. That is, yeah, that, that, that's a huge one. Like if you're get, for example, if I'm a disinformation company within the US and I'm, in, and I'm funded entirely by the Pentagon, what are people gonna think? Or like you can't go against what they want or any of their interests because they fund you and they can go like that and you know it's gone so i think funding is crucial in terms of in terms of that and um also just make it a point to create those higher intellectual spaces right i mean i have no problem with all the folk bands that we have i think they're wonderful i have no problems with all the other projects people have been doing uh, i do really think though is that we are not at the level in terms of institutional creation that there needs to be. So in this, I mean, it sounds crazy even, even in your head now, right? But we're talking about at least high schools, gymnasiums, gymnasiums in, in the European sense. The Americans won't really get what I'm saying here, but gymnasiums think of like, I don't know a good example, but think like prep schools, essentially. Universities, things like that, where all in all in the Russian language within the Russian you know cultural sphere, and so that there can be development there, and so I mean I think those are kind of the I think those are kind of the basic points. Um, it's just all so murky right now that it's almost you. It's hard to pick an exact place, and I say it's not going to be some, you know, Caesar here that's going to unite everyone and suddenly everything is going to be so much better. I think it really is a cultural problem and it, and I'm calling it a cultural problem in a way in that other diasporas don't have other diasporas and not even that it's just homelanders as well. They don't have this problem. You don't see Jewish people having this problem of intellectual sovereignty you don't see armenians having this problem you know assyrians are, are a different story but you know because like different factions um they actually might be the closest uh, in terms of like our situation within the middle east now um people will say kurds and stuff like that uh by but, but they are way more t together in sort in terms of identity um than than what assyrians and also especially what assyrians have gone through um, but that's besides the point people forming saying hey um let's create this high school let's create this private school let's you know let's actually put money into like ventures in intellectual creation you know that's you know that's what it needs to do on this level and then eventually institutional growth do you see this changing in the future long term yes short term no i think that we're still stuck in the boundaries of novelty and formation. That sounds kind of buzzwordy, right? That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, but we're still stuck in, in terms of just like regaining what we lost and we haven't really been able to move forward yet past this. Now I'm not saying that isn't important because it's a process, right? So what I'm talking about here is that first you know, especially after coming out of the USSR, the first part was just, hey, we can actually say that we're Rusin now and understanding, well, what was our history? And and that problem still isn't figured out yet. Um, but it's it's those things where you need to, you know, you need to crawl before you can walk, before before you can run. And so I think there's still a lot of questions that have yet to be answered. And I think that um, you know, not 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 to name any names, but there's a lot of different um different how would I say this? Different ways that people identify what a Rusin is. So in my own personal case, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. I don't think boycotts are Rusins at all. I don't think that, I don't think any of them even really identify as Rusins and I don't think they should be included in that. Now, for example, another question is like, is like Hutzels too? Are they Rusins? I think so. 
and I think there's a lot of reasons, which I've gotten into in many different content before, so there's no reason to bring it up now. But it's these questions that like we can't even answer who we are. Like if you went up to a Frenchman, right, and you asked who is like who is French, right? Do do you think they'd be able to tell you who like who a Frenchman is easily? Very pro probably very easily. Everyone in France, right? What or, or like Polish, like like you could tell someone this is what a pole is, right? Yeah. You know, and so, or like, you go to a Japanese person, they know what a Japanese person is. And so we don't even have that. Like, we don't even have the bare bones, um, just definitions of who we are. So to think we're suddenly going to go to the top in terms of actually establishing political desires, political organizations, um, anything like that, I just, I, you know, I just, I think that's insane um, to think that it's going to happen. I, I don't think it's going to happen soon at all. I don't. And so, and this goes to a, a, a bigger point too, in a way, in that many people would disagree even with what I'm trying to do here, whether it be within the books or with this talk probably, or videos. And they either think, I'm not, I'm not feeling like steel man in their um, opinions at this time, but um, you know, it's a lot of either you're being too authoritarian about it, not being inclusive, um, being too, um, militant, so to speak. Um, and I just, um, and I question, do you think we are going to get to where we need to be in 20 years if we don't continue to, to take these steps? I mean, where do you want to go? And that question is still not answered. And I don't think it's, everyone has their, you know, people can say everyone has their own opinion and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but uh, when, when we're talking about national development, that's that's bullshit. I mean, you can clearly come up with some overarching goals that aren't that aren't crazy. For example, I don't think it's that hard for if you put all the Russians into a room and you say, "Hey, we want uh, we want to be a more wealthy region." Yes. Hey, we, we want our language to be spoken more often and not worry about it dying out. I think most would agree, some wouldn't, but I think most would agree, yes. Preserve our, our heritage, of course. So it's like these things are not that hard. I think what people mistake as um, different end goals is the ways to get there. And I think a lot of sections within the activist community, they have widely different ways of trying to reach that point. And in a way, I'm actually fine with it because it in itself creates intellectual sovereignty because um, you're essentially fighting against each other, but we are trying to find our own way forward. And I think that even if, even if nobody agrees with me right now, or I, you know, even if no one is agreeing with each other, uh, I think it's much better than not having anyone be interested at all in it. So I think it, in those terms, you can't always look at it negatively. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not excited for the next five years, but I'm excited for the next 20 years, so.